Please turn in your Bibles now to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Luke, chapter 13. Last time we began our study of this chapter, where we saw Jesus dispel a common misunderstanding about sin and suffering. Jesus used two current events of his time, current events for them, <clears throat> as examples of why a person's or a group of people's suffering is not always automatically a divine punishment for sin. In fact, it's possible that an instance uh, of even tragic suffering or death might not, be, uh, might not be directly related to sin at all. Remember that it was commonly believed that sinfulness was always the direct cause for someone's suffering. That suffering must have been caused by sin directly, like we read from Job's friends. And so the two events that Jesus referred to were, one, when Pontius Pilate had some Galileans murdered, and two, when a tower in the town of Siloam fell, it collapsed, and killed 18 people. Both of those events were great tragedies, obviously, and Jesus asked the people around him the same question about both of those tragic situations. The question being, do you think those people were worse sinners than all others around them because such tragic things happened to them and not to others? And he answered his own question both times. The answer is no. That's not the case. They were not, in fact, worse sinners. That's not directly why those tragic things happened to them. Tragedies and events, even the kinds of things that we see in the news regularly, even in the last few hours, tragedies and events of great suffering are sometimes a direct result of sin. They are sometimes divine punishments or divine judgments, and they are sometimes also not. Sometimes they are merely things that happen. And we get that perspective from Jesus because he used those two different kinds of events. One in which an evil person did evil things to people and one in which there wasn't evil involved at all. It was just the collapse of an inanimate object, a tower. And in those two kinds of deliberately used events, we see that things sometimes just happen and it does not necessarily have to do with the sinfulness or the deservedness of the people who suffer. That's just not always the case. The scriptures do make abundantly plain that there is indeed such a thing as divine judgment, as divine punishment, and that there, is all, there are also times when that is not the explanation for what happened. And Jesus used that point to make his main point, which was this. You need to repent. All people need to repent. Those 18 Galileans on whom the tower fell, they needed to repent. The people who were murdered by Pilate's soldiers, they needed to repent. But a lack of repentance was not why they died on those two instances. In fact, he, he broadens out the entire thing to everybody listening, and he says, you all likewise will perish. He says, you need to repent. That's the need for all people. And you, we talked about how the main point is not how you go out of this life or why, directly speaking, you go out of this life, but the fact that it is a certainty that you will exit this life. And it is a certainty that you will indeed stand before the living God. And so in that instance, everyone is subject to a divine judgment of that kind. And therefore, Jesus' main point, his underlying lesson for the entire thing, for every listener regardless of one's perceived level of sinfulness, his point for every listener was, you need to repent before the living God. Because do you know how it is or when it is or how much time you've got or how you'll exit this life? Did, did they know the tower was going to fall on them that day? Did those people expect uh, Pilate's soldiers to come uh, crashing through the crowd? Did the people at that club last night expect that they would go there and die? They did not. Do you know for sure that you will have days and, and weeks and, and months and, and years of life in front of you so repentance can just be delayed and put off as something that's not urgent? Do you have any idea 
how much time you have or the manner in which you will exit this life. You have absolutely no idea. And neither do I. And therefore, repentance is the prescription given to us by Jesus Christ. Repent before God. Turn to him uh, by faith in Christ. That was the main lesson that you have there. He plainly taught that not only in the beginning verses of Luke 13, but in a number of places. So Jesus did not only teach, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, be merciful, kind. He also taught you absolutely, every one of us is in need of repentance before God. After that, Jesus told the parable of the barren fig tree. We talked about how that would have been easily understood to be a reference to the nation of Israel based on Old Testament prophetic scriptures. And so with that parable, Jesus warned his listeners to avoid being wasteful with the great privilege and honor God had given them. In very specific terms, given the imagery that he used, we know that he is speaking to God's chosen people, Israel. He absolutely is talking directly to them about not wasting what it is they had been given, the great privilege and position and honor among all people that they as God's chosen people have and do still hold, especially for Jesus' immediate crowd in light of the fact that Messiah the promised Messiah, had come and was among them, the one even teaching them these things. And with that, uh, with that warning that he gave, it made all the more urgent uh, coming on the heels of what Jesus just called people to do across the board, which was repent and don't be wasteful. Don't be barren. Don't be fruitless. And so the warning to be fruitful with what God has given, fruitful with what God has revealed, fruitful with what God has done for us in general, and certainly fruitful for, uh, with what God has done for each of us individually. Those things he's placed into your own hands, my own hands, ways in which he's called us to follow him and to serve him and to represent him in this world, that we are warned to not be wasteful, but instead to be fruitful. Today we continue in chapter 13 as we're going to see Jesus heal a woman. And we will see Jesus rebuke a religious leader's complaint about it. All of it we'll see in the context of God's words and commandments and God's value system and God's worldview. So that lays in front of us today in Luke chapter 13. Let's begin now where we picked up, uh, where we're going to pick up now, where we left off last time. Luke 13 verse 10. It says, now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Here we see Jesus doing something that was fairly common for him. Not only gathering with the men of Israel in the synagogues on the Sabbath, that would have absolutely been common and expected of him as a man of Israel to be doing so. But specifically, we see that Jesus is here not just gathered, but teaching as well. Uh, Although he did not come up in the schools that the religious leaders did, he was widely recognized as a teacher, often referred to as a rabbi. And so he would be given opportunity to teach in the synagogues often. Uh, rabbis and acknowledged teachers would would do that on a regular basis, obviously, and he was uh, the gospels tell us that on a number of occasions he was given opportunity like they were we 're given the clear impression uh, that Jesus, uh, at least for a portion of his ministry years, uh, taught in the synagogues often. Luke said simply back in the end of chapter four that Jesus was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee, and so it just really simply gives us that picture that that was a regular occurrence, not only to gather but to be a teacher. And so that's what's going on here now in verse 10, Luke 13. Jesus is gathered in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He is the one, however, teaching. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospels, you know that Jesus also had some conflicts with the Pharisees and religious leaders of Israel regarding some of the things that he said and did on the Sabbath day. Because they consider, the religious leaders of the day considered, some of those things that Jesus said and did on the Sabbath day to be violations, to be sin, uh, 
of the Sabbath day commandment. And so let's briefly review where the Sabbath day came from in the first place. And to do that, we see that it goes like almost (laughs) any main theme you can come up with in the scriptures, you find it back in Genesis. And so that's where we go to find the beginning of this, back to creation. Genesis tells us that God created everything in six days, and that on the seventh day, God rested, or that he ceased from his creative work. He worked in creation for six days. On that seventh day, he did no more creative work. The scriptures give us that very easy understanding of the beginning of things. From Adam, therefore up through Noah and the flood, and then up through the times of Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then the times of uh, the Hebrews in Egypt, and then up to the life of Moses, that was all that there really was to it on the timeline. It was just something that God had done back during the creation week. When we get to Exodus chapter 16, though, we see when the Israelites are there in the wilderness and Moses is leading them and God gave them in the wilderness manna to eat. He miraculously fed them every morning of every single day except the seventh day of the week. God commanded them through the six days of the week, the first six days to take uh, their, for the first five days, I should say, take your daily portion. For just today. Don't take more than that. On the sixth day, you're to take a double portion. You're to take today's day six portion and tomorrow's day seven, Sabbath day portion. There will not be provision on the seventh day, on the morning. You go outside, you'll find no manna. On day six, you're to take that double portion. Again, no more than that. Take exactly what you're told. Rely on that. Trust in God's provision for you and you will see that God's provision through six will be enough for seven. And that's the principle that we see God establish for himself in the creative uh, or the creation week. We see him then begin to institute it for his people. He did not want them going out, gathering up uh, their daily sustenance on that seventh day. It was very much the Lord telling them to not be worried about that at all or anxious. I have provided for you uh, everything that you need. And God did that very thing for every year that they were in the wilderness until they entered uh, the land of Canaan, the promised land, and then the bounty of the promised land was theirs to enjoy. They did not need manna anymore. The next time, as far as the scriptures are concerned, that we see the Sabbath day mentioned is in Exodus chapter 20. That is where God made it a part of the Ten Commandments that he gave Moses at Mount Sinai. And in that chapter, God said this, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, meaning your servant who might be not a Hebrew. For in six days, God says through Moses, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or made it holy, or sanctified it and set it apart as something special for God's use. And so there we have the commandment based on God's work of creation. God said this, it's based on that creation week, that model, real days, six of them, and then a real seventh day. Resting or ceasing is what God did on the seventh, and now for his people, he says it is to be the same with them. Trusting God that his provision, as I said, through six will be enough for seven. And it is a matter of faith then to do so, faithful obedience to God to trust that what he has said will take place. Your collection of six on day six will be enough, trust me. And if you don't trust me and you go out on day seven and try to find manna, you'll not find any. That is how it's going to work. So it is an act of faith and obedience to trust God's ability and desire to provide. Now that last portion of the commandment is important for us to keep in mind when we consider what Jesus said and did on some Sabbath days that we have recorded in the Gospels. That last part being, The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. As I said, to bless it, to 
make it a good thing. A blessing is a good thing. It's a good gift. That's what a blessing is to hallow it, is to make it holy, to sanctify it, to set it apart as this good thing for God's purposes. Now, that's the basic historical background. And like I said, the religious leaders took issue with Jesus on some of his Sabbath behavior at times. So let's look back, if you would, please. Keep your place here. It won't be difficult. We're only going back to Luke chapter 6. We're going to go back here for a few minutes, and we're going to see a couple of those instances of conflict. And it's going to help give us a little more historical context, as well as we'll see Jesus, how he corrected the misunderstanding and misapplication uh, of those or, or by those religious leaders regarding the Sabbath, since they were judging him as having violated it. When in fact, all Jesus was doing was violating man-made regulations, which you can count on Jesus to do on a regular basis, uh, violate man-made rules, but not God's. So go back to Luke chapter six, if you would. I'll join you there since I sent you there. Yeah, just go there. Let me know how it goes. All right, Luke chapter 6. Let's uh, follow along with me. First five verses is the first scene. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he, Jesus, went through the grain fields. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said to them, the disciples, why are you doing what it's not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry? he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So there in that Sabbath, that that the accusation of violating the Sabbath in that scene, we see Jesus go back to one of the most revered figures in all of their history. That's David. He's referencing what took place recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. David was on the run from King Saul, and David and his men were in need of food, as Jesus referred to there. David and his guys came to the city of Nob, and they went into the tabernacle there and saw Ahimelech, the priest. David and his men were hungry, the only available bread was the showbread. The showbread there in the tabernacle that, as Jesus pointed out, according to God's law, that bread was meant for the priests to eat only. Twelve loaves of bread there representing the twelve tribes of Israel. According to God's law regarding the showbread, every seven days the showbread loaves would be replaced with fresh loaves, and the priests would then eat that bread. But only the priests. Jesus, however, shows that example, and he uses that to make the point that human need of hunger is an example of something that supersedes the ritual of the law. Human need is to be met over and above. And because of that, Jesus makes the point, that's why neither you, religious leaders, nor I, Jesus, that's why none of us fault David. None of us look back on that and judge him as being a Sabbath violator. He'd be viewed differently if he was. He wouldn't be so revered. And he said, and and religious leaders don't hold him in low regard because of what he did. In addition to that, Matthew's Gospel In chapter 12, it includes that Jesus, after Matthew's record of this, Jesus includes uh, addressing the work of the priesthood on the Sabbath. Jesus says there, or, he adds, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and yet are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. So Jesus even gives another example there, not only David, but think about the priesthood in general. He says they profane the Sabbath every single week, and we don't hold them as violators of the Sabbath. Why not? The Levitical law given by God commanded that double sacrifices were to be made by the priests on the Sabbath day. Also, as I mentioned the showbread earlier, the fresh showbread was to be baked on the Sabbath to replace the prior week's bread loaves. And so not only did the priesthood not cease from working on the Sabbath day, they did a lot of extra work on the Sabbath day, work directly related to their quote-unquote profession of being priests. 
And yet, Jesus says, and this was not new information for them, he says, and yet they're blameless. We do not hold them as violators of the Sabbath. Even though they violated the letter of the law, don't work on the Sabbath. Jesus says we do not uh, hold them as violators. Ancient rabbis concluded about that ongoing situation with the priesthood working uh, on the Sabbath in the way that they did. They concluded that it was because their work occurred in the temple that their work was acceptable as a service unto God rather than being Sabbath breaking. And the Pharisees could very well have been ready to make that argument uh, after Jesus mentioned that here, saying, yeah, but your, your disciples are here in the grain fields. They're not in the temple. They're not doing temple work. Uh, they're not priests. And so they are still in violation. And that could very well be why Jesus made the next statement in verse 6 before they could even utter that argument. He says, and one greater, by the way, one greater than the temple is here. Where? In the grain field? Yeah, Jesus one greater than the temple is here. Jesus is greater than the temple. The temple is the picture of the presence of God on the earth. I think Jesus is, does well to supersede that and represent, not only represent, but actually be the presence of God in the earth. God in the flesh on the earth. And so, yes, one greater than the temple was there. Certainly by then the Pharisees' stomachs are churning and they are, are spitting at how it is that Jesus is correcting them on the Sabbath day. But people like those scribes and those Pharisees had, for many, many years, been defining and redefining and adding and multiplying to the laws of God. It is certainly true that God gave many commandments, many laws. But these guys multiplied those laws and explanations of those laws and subsection explanations of those laws and multiplied those things to extremes. It is possible, and I would even contend likely, that they began to do that from a good place, from a good heart, of wanting, very likely, wanting to just understand, right? So if God says, which is a fairly blanket statement, do not work on the Sabbath, I think it's understandable that we would want to have a discussion and go, okay, what we probably ought to kind of settle on what it is that God means by work, right? We, we want to make sure that we don't do don'ts and that we do do do's. You like that? On the Sabbath, that we do what God allows. He obviously allows some activity, but he prohibits work. So let's talk about work and, and get an understanding. Kind of, let's get a framework here for what work really is. And, and for me, I think it likely came from a good heart. Let's, let's talk about this and get, a, get an understanding, a working understanding, so that we can teach the people. Aren't they going to come and say, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means, and, and we've talked about it, and, so, and here's the explanation. So I think it likely came from a good desire. However, like a lot of things that began in a good place, man's tinkering and finagling and rearranging and redefining eventually becomes a perversion and a corruption, eventually becomes a man-made ugly thing built on top and over and kind of blocking the view of the thing that God started there in the middle uh, at the start, and, and it's hard to even see, wait, what, what is this based on again? All these rules and regulations about this thing in, in the context here, the Sabbath day, w w wait, where, where does this even come from? That is what men do, just so that you know, when they get a hold of something good and pure that God has said and try to make a, a man-made framework. Not an evil desire to understand a little bit of what God means by don't work. But this is what happens. And eventually, the ridiculous micromanagement of how it is that you are to not work on the Sabbath day becomes one of the many examples in the scriptures this is one of the chief examples really because jesus refers to it several times one of the chief examples of heavy laden burdened down and heavy laden people because of what the religious leaders had done to them over and on top of what god had said should you do what god has said as god's people absolutely you're not absolved from that just because well god's gracious and he forgives god's also your king and so you obey 
you do what God says because you say he's your Lord. That's not legalism. That's obedience. And that's a loving relationship of a child to the father. The legalism, the ugly legalism, that word comes in where we have these kinds of things that the religious leaders had built over and on top of and, as we'll see, superseding, actually, God's laws. And so there is, on the one side, or there's not two sides, uh, point A would be there's great danger in establishing man-made regulations and putting them on par with what God has said. Obviously, that's something that is, there's danger there. What happens, though, eventually, once you've reached that point, eventually, because, you know, you're a human, and because I'm a human, if I'm not careful, I am going to eventually elevate the man-made regulations even above the doctrine of God. And Jesus condemned them for that in another place as well. But that's the kind of thing that they have here as they micromanaged and redefined and, and, and made the definition of work something that became super detailed and cumbersome and nearly impossible to even abide by, even if you wanted to. One of the things that they had to define was, if, if, if we have to define what work is to not do it on the Sabbath, what's work? One way to define work was carrying a burden. I've told you these kinds of things before. So then you have to define what a burden is. They define burden by weight. They define burden by the distance that you're allowed to carry it. They also define distance that you're allowed to walk, whether you're carrying a burden or not. If you're not carrying a burden, you can walk a little farther on the Sabbath day. And there were a number of things, weights and sizes and all kinds of regulations that came down to define burden under the category of work on the Sabbath day. Jewish uh, rabbinical teachings and commentaries uh, in the, uh, about the Torah, you have the Mishnah and you have the Talmud. And in those books, you have 39 categories of forbidden work on the Sabbath day. But that's not God's word. Those are teachers' commentaries from the past, highly respected men, rabbis and learned men. But those are the commentaries. Valuable? Sure. God's word? No. God's word doesn't have 39 categories of forbidden work on the Sabbath day. And it's important for us to recognize that. Not surprisingly, all those interpretations and commentaries and regulations and definitions and redefinitions, all those kinds of things end up being what you'd expect among men, which is a competition of man-pleasing between religious leaders as to who's more holy and who's more pious and a big show of who's more religious in those kinds of ways. That's among them. What about for regular people? Well, they ended up living in more fear of the Sabbath than anything else. Did they look forward to it? Because God said it was a blessing. Does it sound like a day that you'd look forward to as a blessing? As a good thing given from God? You go, oh, the Sabbath is, is approaching. I'm I'm excited. It's a blessing. It's a good thing to enjoy it. It's a day of refreshment. Not likely. Likely it's a day you're dreading. And not because it's this overwhelming fear that you might violate the Sabbath and make God angry. It's an overwhelming fear that you might violate the Sabbath according to the religious leaders and make them angry. And then they might decree that you're kicked out of the synagogue and you're not a part of the congregation anymore. And now you're deemed to be not a part of the people of God. And I don't want to do that. You've got a problem on your hands as the Sabbath approaches. Yay, Sabbath. Not so much for these people in this situation. More anxiety than a refreshment looked forward to. So mountains of tradition had been given authority in people's lives and that oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, not on par with God's commandments, but even above what God actually commanded. And that is what we see here. That is what Jesus is correcting. Look at how he corrected them in that instance. All right, he takes their eyes off of the man-made traditions, puts their focus back on God's word, right? He doesn't reference an old rabbi and say, well, rabbi so-and-so said this and that. He just points them to God's word. That's the authority, not the commentaries. God's word is the authority, not the opinions, And not the popular positions either, God's word. And he twice in that section rebukingly says, haven't you even read? Because I I know you know what the rabbis say, but have you not read, which he knows they have, have you not read what God said? Have you not read the scriptures? Are you not relying on the scriptures? And obviously it's rhetorical, they're not. 
Are explanations and teachings of the scriptures then of value? Of course they are. I mean, what are we doing here? Of course it's of value, but it's of far less value when we go off into other areas where God has not clearly spoken. If he has clearly spoken, then we need to let him clearly speak. Jesus did the same thing in the synagogues on a regular basis, right? He went around teaching from the scriptures. But their regulations went above and beyond the scriptures, even making room for violating the heart of the law, violating the purpose of the Sabbath, which was to be a blessing, a day where God gets glory, where God gets the thankfulness that he deserves for faithfully providing. Back in Luke 6, verse 5, we saw Jesus conclude his rebuke by saying the following, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath, right? You remember the term Son of Man, that's a title for Messiah, Remember that just prior to that, in Luke chapter 5, that's when Jesus told the paralytic who was lowered through the roof by his friends, he told the paralytic that his sins were forgiven. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law present there considered it blasphemy, since only God can forgive sins. And they're not wrong. Jesus said, and this is how they understood what Jesus meant, how he was referring to himself as deity, because he called himself the Son of Man and, and gave to himself the authority to forgive sins on the earth. And then Jesus healed the man too, by the way, of his paralysis. The Son of Man, Jesus was saying, is himself. Not only that, he showed them that Messiah is also God. So he's the promised anointed one of God. He's also God himself. He is God and man. This is what uh, he showed them there again by saying the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, obviously, Yahweh, Jehovah God, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so if I know that and you tell me the, the Son of Man and you refer to yourself and you say, I'm also the Lord of the Sabbath, I know what you're saying. And I think that you know what you're saying. And you're either telling the truth or you're a blasphemer and worthy of death. So it's one or the other. There's, not, there's no gray area there in between. That's who you are. You're either actually God or you're not, and you're lying. Remember the commandment itself about the Sabbath, right? <clears throat> the last verse in Exodus 20 that I referenced earlier, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and the Lord made it holy. And Jesus just in that prior chapter ascribed that to himself. He set it apart for man's good, for God's glory. Jesus affirms that truth. And in fact, in Mark's account of this exchange in Mark 2, it includes the following statement from Jesus that kind of rounds that out, that Jesus additionally said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not your God. God is your God. And if he says don't work on the Sabbath, you work for six and rest for seven, and you acknowledge God's provision on the seventh day, then just do that. And don't work. Do not work for your provision, for your sustenance. Don't do that on the seventh day. It doesn't need greater detail or explanation than that necessarily. Now, more closely to what we see uh, related taking place here in Luke 13, I want you to look at what happens next in Luke 6, beginning in chapter 6, or in chapter 6, verse 6. All right, here's another example of the over-the-top regulations and ritual keeping. So there in Luke 6, 6, now it happened on another Sabbath also that he, <clears throat> he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And so the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Not filled with rejoicing, filled with rage. And again, you have the the examples of over-the-top regulations and ritual keeping here. Some of the rabbis taught on this particular topic of healing on the Sabbath. Again, this is on the Sabbath. Some of the rabbis taught that healing in general qualified as working on the Sabbath day. And therefore, as we see represented there 
you can't heal. That's breaking the Sabbath. You cannot heal on the Sabbath day because that's considered work. Therefore, on the Sabbath day, the only medical treatment someone could receive was that which would preserve life, basically. So if you're bleeding, the bleeding can be stopped with a bandage, but medicine can't be applied because that promotes healing. If you break your leg, it can't be set on the Sabbath day because that gets your bone ready to heal back in place. We can set it tomorrow, but we can't set it today. And those kinds of things. And so life-saving only is the kind of quote-unquote healing or medical attention that you can get. But on the Sabbath day, healing generally speaking, and certainly like we see what Jesus do with a man with a withered hand, and in Luke 13, which is actually our text for today, the woman with the infirmity, 18 years, who cannot stand up straight. We see Jesus not do just a simple life-saving thing, but that he gives the full healing. And like we saw already in Luke 6, we see again now in Luke 13, that is something that the religious leaders easily, uh, plainly, clearly called work. And you can't do that on the Sabbath day. So, it's an easy question now. If, if you can only bandage a bleeding wound and if you can't set a broken bone on the Sabbath day, how do you think they feel when they see Jesus come along in the synagogue too and fully heal, a full-blown healing on the Sabbath day? You can expect them to respond mm, angrily. But this is the point that Jesus is teaching on all this and this is how dangerous their misconceptions were because they misled the people. Think back to the commandment itself again. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day. The Lord didn't make it a burden. He made it a blessing. He didn't make it something to dread. He made it something to look forward to and enjoy. And so absolutely work hard on the appointed days for work. Absolutely work for your daily sustenance, for the provision for your life. You work for those six. Do that and then rest on the seventh and be refreshed. And God would say, and trust me then to provide for all your needs from the fruit of your labors for six days and from the display of your obedient faith on the seventh day. And I will provide for all those things. So enjoy the day. Really should have been a highlight of the week, right? Not something dreaded. Not something that'd make you heavy laden and and maybe walk around during the day wondering if you're breaking the Sabbath. Because the burden of keeping the traditions of the religious leaders. And so, really, when you consider this now, of all the seven days of the week, as far as God is concerned, of all the seven days of the week, what day would be the most ideal for healing, helping, serving, blessing, doing things that benefit others? What's the best day of the week to do that on? It's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is a day where you glorify God. The Sabbath day is a day where you thank God for his provision. The Sabbath day is a day of appreciation for God's faithfulness and a time for you to be refreshed and rest. And if you're the instrument of refreshment, praise God. People are being refreshed and blessed, strengthened, and acknowledging the glory and the faithfulness of God. That's what's supposed to be taking place on the Sabbath day. So healing on the Sabbath day, that actually is pretty fantastic. Perfect day for a healing. So of course, that man should be healed on the Sabbath because it absolutely is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And that's what it's all about. With what I've just told you, recognizing that what we just went through in Luke 6 took place before what happens in Luke 13... Do you understand now what we're about to see? Or you will once we read it. You'll see why Jesus does what he does. You'll see why the religious ruler says what he says. And you'll see why Jesus responds back to him so harshly. Why? Because we've gone over this before, Jesus would say. He wouldn't reference him to Luke 6. We would do that. We do the addresses. But Luke in his ministry, or Jesus in his ministry, he's covered this ground already. And here he is in the synagogue and he has a religious leader telling a woman and a crowd, you know what? Come back for healing another day. It's an astonishing thing that he says. So again, let's pick up in 10 and go through verse 13 here. Back in Luke 13, all right? So we have a lot of foreground that we have uh, established for us, all right? So again, 
Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. She was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Verse 12. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. And what did she do? And she glorified God. Is that not what's supposed to take place on the Sabbath day? Should you not be given more reasons to glorify God on the Sabbath day or less reasons? Walking away thinking, I might have made God angry. No, instead, you should be glorifying God for his goodness, his faithfulness. With what we've talked about already, with the heart of the Sabbath, the main purpose of observing it uh, according to God's commandment is to glorify him, to give him his well-deserved appreciation for how good and faithful he is in providing for our needs. And we should certainly express our thankfulness to God every day and in all things, as Paul says. But the Sabbath is especially set aside by design to highlight reasons we should give God thanks and praise. Reasons where we acknowledge God's gracious provision and mercy. So it is a day to recognize that and give him glory. And we we read again, what the result of this healing was. At the end of verse 13, she glorified God. She had endured this affliction, as it says there, for 18 years. And in thinking about that, I think that it's easy to picture that she very likely had become a fixture in the lives of the people around there, that they probably didn't really notice her infirmity much anymore. She's just that lady. And so you don't take special notice of the infirmity. And in fact, over time this happens, there might not even be much notice of her either. And it certainly could be the case, based on what we talked about last time, that the people speculated, you know why she is bent over like that and can't stand up straight. What did Jesus correct earlier? Well, it's probably because of her own sinfulness. She got what she deserved. She got judged by God for something that happened 18 years ago or whatever, that would likely be in their, in their minds, right? Based on where we just saw Jesus talk. And so if you're thinking about that regarding a person, and, and if you've pulled that judgment out on them, you're not real likely to think highly of them, nor are you likely to show them compassion or really care at all that she can't carry her stuff. Why not? Because she's bent over. She can't even stand up straight. But you know what? She probably got what she deserved. You remember, that's the mindset. I'm not making that up. That's the general mindset of why people suffer. There is obviously great danger in robbing someone of the compassion that they should receive from people. That could very well have been what they thought of her. Oh, well. But Jesus already taught that that's not always the case. So don't immediately assume that. We're to be very careful about that. And he affirms that that actually is the point with her specifically. That's not why this happened to her. He'll do that in a minute. But look again at how very noticed this woman and her affliction are by Jesus. Right? Verse 12, when he saw her, he called her. He called her to him. He spoke to her. He laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight. And what did she do? She glorified God. The very appropriate response for every healing The intended purpose of any healing is to give God glory for his goodness. As I've said before, however, the ruler of the synagogue is not on board. Verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, the ruler of the synagogue said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. So picture that scene, right? Jesus has just, he's been teaching, which is, has, the scriptures tell us was always impressive anyway, because Jesus taught with power and authority, unlike any of the other rabbis. So th- this is already a place that's buzzing, because Jesus was teaching. And then the woman with the infirmity is there, and he calls her to him, and in the midst of everybody, he lays his hands on her, he heals her, he looses her from the infirmity. People are rejoicing. There is that entire scene. There's the buzz from the teaching, the rejoicing from the healing. This is fantastic. Like it says in other places, we've never seen stuff like this before. And then there's the ruler of the synagogue. Hey, 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 
calm down. And in fact, be quiet. You know, this shouldn't even have happened here today. And notice who he does not challenge. He does not challenge Jesus. Why? That's why I spent a lot of time in Luke 6 earlier. Jesus has covered this ground with the religious leaders before. And if this dude wasn't present in Luke 6, he very likely heard of it by Luke 13. So does he have a problem with what Jesus did? He does, but he's not going to challenge Jesus in front of everybody. He's going to yell at the crowd. You know, the people he actually has, at least until now, enjoyed some power over. You lame crowd. You know, how, what is wrong with you that you would come here and expect something like this? He doesn't, it's like Jesus isn't even there. And he berates the crowd. And he says, you know, men ought to work, which we see him, like I said, from the, from the rabbis, he equates work on the Sabbath with healing, right? That's a very clear line that he draws there. He connects those two dots. Men ought to work on six days. And you all know this. So come on those days if you want to be healed, meaning this man can work on those days. Not on the seventh day. Not on the Sabbath day. This kind of thing is inappropriate for the Sabbath. That is an astonishing thing that he would say. And he directs his anger at the crowd and not at Jesus. But then Jesus, he's going to point out that these same religious leaders, they're forbidding on the Sabbath what their traditional teachings have forbidden. But they're not, for, they're not forbidding what God has forbidden. And so Jesus points out that these same religious leaders, while they condemn the healing or the doing good on the Sabbath for a person, they condemn that, but they do not forbid such a thing from happening for less than a person. And Jesus nails him on that. Look at verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So it's a day of refreshment for your ox and your donkey. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, should she not be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. As I mentioned earlier, just real briefly, we see that Jesus validates the fact that this woman is not suffering of divine judgment, right? That would be the assumed reason. And Jesus, like he had taught on before, that's not always the case. And just so you know, Satan has bound this woman for 18 years. Not divine judgment from God. Satan did this. He's responsible, okay? This is the kind of stuff he does in the world. Steal, kill, destroy. Deceive, distract, ruin. That's what he does. That's his work. That's his bitter and bad fruit. So if that's going on, then you can, ex you can rest assured who's behind that. He's the afflictor here. So in light of what Jesus just taught on before this, we see that they should not, and we certainly should not, cast off a person in their suffering, assuming that they brought it on themselves. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. If they did, Jesus still showed those people compassion. If they did not, there's an extra reason to show them compassion if you needed one. We have to be careful to not judge wrongly based only on circumstances like we see in this picture here. Second, and this is more to the main point, Jesus brings this up here. Compare the good that you would gladly do for your animal with the less than good that you would be willing to do for a person. You're willing to do more good for your animal on the Sabbath than you are to allow a good thing to happen to a person to a human, to a daughter of Abraham, Jesus says here. There is, there's a lot that he is saying when he says that. There's, there is affection there for a daughter of Abraham, but there is, uh, there is the privilege that goes with the lineage. Hey, she's one of the chosen people here, you know. No less so than any of you, including you religious leader. You're all descendants from the same line. She's in, as much in the line as you are. And so if she can receive a blessing just like you can receive a blessing, then why would you stand in the way of that? And, Jesus makes the point, if you're willing to do a good thing for your animal 
why would you be in the way of a good thing happening to a person? Someone created in the image of God. Animals and people created by God? Yes. Fantastic? Yes. God calls the animals when he creates them during creation on that day, just like he said on all the prior dates. He says, that's good. Yes, they are good. And they're good to eat, too. But they are good. They're good creations by God. They are not, however, created in the image of God. That is a unique place for mankind, for humankind. That's a unique place. Generally speaking, obviously, I think animals are not, not only are they not the same as, they're not on par with mankind, but they are less than. They are, by design, by purpose, less than. In, va- in value and in kind and in function and in purpose. But people often make the same hypocritical mistake that Jesus is rebuking here. Today, though, they do it from an extremely dangerous and anti-biblical worldview of evolution when they equate animals and people and eventually down the road, what they end up doing is elevating animals above mankind. That is something that happens, that has happened, and that is happening. Now, that's not the religious leader's problem. He's not looking at this from an evolutionary worldview. Here's where there's a connection, though. The framework of understanding the world around him came from the same faulty thinking, meaning he made the mistake of not only elevating man's laws to the level of God's laws, but then he made man's laws superior to God's laws and downgraded what God said. It's the same fundamental problem for the ruler of the synagogue here as the evolutionary worldview also espouses and so that's the framework that presents the problem because whether we're talking about meat not meat that's not the point the point is if you on any topic take man's law and you begin to downgrade god's law and you begin to elevate man's law you will do what we see being described here that's where this man's thinking came from not from an evolutionary thing that we see today where animals are are not just equal to but they're even more important actually than people and you have PETA and people like that who have an outcry for the bad treatment of animals and say nothing about the bad treatment of people they say nothing about abortion They say nothing about sex trafficking. They say nothing about euthanasia. They say nothing about any number of topics, which is a hypocritically inconsistent viewpoint if, in fact, we're just animals like the animals. And so it's inconsistent and frustrating that they would say one thing and then complain about the other, and it's an inconsistent spot. It's unreasonable. Nonetheless, that's something that we see. The biblical worldview, however, is actually the only one that gives you the value of the person sitting next to you because of what God has said, because how and why they were created. Animals, good. Animals, fantastic. Animals, majestic. If you're wondering about that, grab David's teaching from this uh, last Wednesday night. Humans, however, superior. Superior. And as God said, we have dominion over them. They are not to be placed on par with us. And and just to get the point, this is Jesus' point. How? How can you be willing to do a good thing for your beast and refuse an even better thing for your sister? And the main point of that is that will happen. A perversion like that happens. When we make room, when people make room for an ignoring and a downgrading of what God has said, the authority of God's word, and in place of that, man's word, man's laws, man's rules and regulations. And then you have what the scriptures constantly warn against, which is everyone doing right in their own eyes, instead of doing what God has said is right. 
Let's pray. God, our Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would help us to, I think, probably not be distracted by the, by the specific content of animal versus human. I just pray, Lord, that the main point gets through. It's not about what we eat or don't eat. It's not about that stuff. It's not about having pets or not having pets. It's, it's, it's none of those things. We are to appreciate every good thing that you've given to us. And we're to be good and kind and caring and wise with the good things that you have given to us. And in particular, that applies to people. More than anything, that applies to people. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep in its proper place of authority your word, your laws, your commandments, your authority, your lordship. And that we would appreciate for whatever they're worth man's laws and man's explanations. But they in no way rival what you've said and rival the framework and the foundation that you've given. So I pray, Lord, that in this we would see that main point. You are God. Man is not. We trust you. We ask for the strength and endurance and faith to continue to do so all the way to the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.